Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah. It's Sunday, and as such, it is long ride day. It's warming up. The sun is out. It's going to get into the mid-50s, maybe reach 60 today, so should be a good ride. I'm um, going to be pretty much flat. I'm going to probably target somewhere maybe around 70 miles, depending on how I'm feeling. Hopefully, I don't feel like complete shit and have to back out, but we'll see. One thing I like about Amazon Prime is that Sunday is never off limits for mail time. All right, so this is a screen protector for the S8 Plus. Uh, Zag does not have anything yet. This is a tempered glass screen protector. So hopefully this is pretty decent. Um, all of the people who make a tempered glass screen protector, they're pretty much right now an off-brand. They're so-so, but I do want to protect the phone, so hopefully this one's pretty decent. Um, what I will say about the new phone, if you've had an edge phone before, um, the edge is not as uh, severe or as uh, prominent as it was in the S7 Edge and phones beforehand, so hopefully this will stick a little bit better because what you get on... Uh, these edge screen protectors at the, the middle will start to raise and you'll start to lose some uh, connectivity with your uh, device in the middle so we'll see I'll get that put on that way I don't have to worry about uh, the inevitable drop of my phone scratching or breaking up my screen although the screen is supposed to be pretty strong I'm still pretty tough on my phone number two I think I've talked about this before in my other video, my uh, supplement video, but uh, replenishing the supply of this EPO boost stuff, um, it's the natural blood booster type of thing. Uh, I think it works pretty well. It helps with like short term recoverability type of thing. So putting in like the high effort and then uh, being able to recover more quickly for another high effort if you use this over time. This is a one month supply. Uh, if you take it as directed, taking for a day, which is a pain in the ass. Um, I think it's around 50 bucks, so it's not a cheap supplement, but it does work pretty well. It's pretty popular. Um, I think most people who use this and they use it as directly, uh, directed will see some kind of results with it, so I'm going to be reintroducing that to the routine probably tomorrow. Um, if I don't do it today, it's going to be a little bit late in the day to start it because you take the four pills at four separate times and doubling up doesn't make you feel so hot. So at any rate, I'm going to finish getting ready here and get ready to get on the bike. <laughs> the General Mills factory. It always smells like Cheerios here. Mmm, Cheerios. Okay, so in my video the other day I talked about riding the drops and how it was a mistake to be on the hoods. And I think I got a little kickback on that because I didn't really go into greater detail. And I did not mean to offend anybody. I did not mean to presume to say that everybody rides wrong. I'm just kind of putting out there a really pragmatic way of riding your bike in a race. The very first crit I ever did was also the very first race I ever did, and that was back in 2015. And I got out there in a field of lower category women, and I rode in a square. Okay, so a few times during this race and the following, I almost got ran off the road. I almost got taken out. I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck is this? I gotta work. I can't afford to be scraped up, lose a, a, an $8,000 bike, snap in half. It's just not worth it. I would find myself basically cutting out of the field and dropping to the back, or dropping out of the race entirely. So I watched the higher category racers, and I even asked a few of the higher category people on my team, well, how do you deal with this? I'm afraid. I don't know how I'm gonna race. I never wanna do a crit again. And they told me very bluntly, in the drops, elbows out. And that's basically taking control of your space. Basically saying, I own this two and a half foot space, which is me on my bike. And nobody's gonna push me out of my space on the bike. And it makes you feel a lot more stable. Instantly, in getting in this position, I felt like I was in a lot more control. Especially when you have not as skilled riders all in your face. Of course, I'm one of those not as skilled riders as well. 
so I don't have as much confidence in my own ability and ownership of my space yet. I've gotten better, but in 2015, I didn't even think I was deserving enough to be there, let alone own my space. So being in the drops makes you a lot more stable. Now I've gotten some of the uh, kickback that says, oh, the pros aren't always in the drops. Okay, well when you're doing seven to, uh, 21 days at 150 to 200 miles a day in a row, you can compare yourself to the pros. When your lowest end race or your shortest distance race is five hours, you can compare yourself to the pros. But most of us are amateurs. We're in short distance races, anywhere between 30 minutes to maybe three hours. We race at a different intensity. You really can't compare an amateur crit to a either a, a grand tour event or even a classics event. It's an entirely different dynamic. So the last thing I think that I am is the end all be all of cycling. Far from it in fact. But I do take a very pragmatic approach and sometimes a hyper rational approach to pretty much anything I do, cycling included. Which means I do a lot of research. Obviously you could do so online in books. And I make it a point to marshal races where I can so I can watch the higher category racers. You can do so at like a corner so you can really view their technique, their style, their form. It's something I recommend all people who are interested in racing to do. And with that said, the best way to ride and race your bike is in a manner that you are comfortable and in the most control personally. But in that regard, you always want to try to make the attempt to train yourself to ride in positions that are going to even give you more control in the long run, even if they're not comfortable right now. So watching or marshalling a crit is one of the best and most functional ways to kind of observe racers and how they, uh, how they race, the things they're doing right, the things they're doing wrong. And it's the best because they do so many laps and you can see them over and over again. And what you'll observe as you watch the peloton in a crit style race with a decent field, let's say 50 or more, is you'll notice that it takes on a different shape than the high that you see in pro racing. Yes, they'll do lap here and there where they'll slow up, they'll sit up. You'll hear them talking even. They've got their hands up on the hoods, they're comfortable, they're colloquial, no real risks. But then you'll see the laps where the heat's on, where they start to pick up the power and they're really racing and they're racing hard. You're not gonna see them on the hoods. I'm sorry, you're not. It's not safe. And if you do see somebody on the hoods, it's either they're so distracted that they've forgotten to get down or they're inexperienced. When you're talking about crits with 90 degree turns, there's a lot of oscillations in speed. They'll pick up the pace, then they'll slow down, and they'll pick up again. And this is gonna raise the potential for wheel touching. If you have your hands on your, your hoods, and you accidentally scrub the rear wheel of the rider in front of you, you very well might lose control of your front wheel because you don't have your, your center of gravity low enough to offset that kind of wobble you're gonna get. And you could take yourself and others down with you. That also goes if you're side by side with somebody. If your arms are up in the, in the hoods and your elbows are in, they could come and hit you in the handlebar, hook you and take you out. If your hands are in the drops and your elbows are a little bit out, you'll be able to kind of lean them away or push them away before they're able to take you or, or you're able to take them out. You're gonna see the same exact thing in the pro peloton when the heat's on. And that's usually reserved for the last portion of the race, the lead in. But on TV, you don't see what the peloton's doing. You see what the lead out trains are doing and the sprinters are doing. But those people who are just trying to preserve positions, especially for tour races, they're in the drops. It's because they need to protect themselves. They need to protect that front wheel. Because if they go down, they may or may not preserve their position. They might be looking for bonus seconds. They might not be looking to start their race the next day. I don't think that the appropriate time to be in the drops is every single minute of every single race. Far from it. It's, it's not conducive. It's not even necessarily safe to be in the drops all the time. There is something to be said about visibility and being able to see around you. When you're in a big pack, like the Pro Peloton is, when you're 10 abreast and possibly 30 deep, yeah, you probably don't want to be in the drops because you want to see what you're doing. But that's not what I'm referring to when I was talking about being in the drops. I'm talking about amateur type racers or even your aggressive Saturday group rides where you're racing for that stop sign and you might be two, three, maybe four abreast tops 
gets a little bit more sketchy because people feel a little bit more comfortable getting aggressive and they become a little bit less stable. That's where being in a drops is key. I'll put it this way. If you're learning to be a better racer or you're looking to start racing and you ask any of your successful Pro 1-2, even Category 3 racers here in the U.S. and I believe the categorization works the same in the U.K. Nobody is going to tell you to race in the hoods. Now that doesn't include, you know, climbing, long road races where your field might get a little bit more blistered apart, you're a little bit more on your own, you actually have to be more efficient up in the hoods or even the tops when you're climbing. But I'm talking about aggressive races, close quarters, zone four, zone five, in a cluster of people, they're not gonna tell you to ride in your hoods. Something I forgot to mention about being in the drops is control over your braking. Now, in a crit, you shouldn't be braking a whole ton, but if catastrophe strikes or you overcook a turn or something like that, you need to be able to control your brake and feather them more effectively and not be as jerky on the brakes. If you're holding them from the hoods, you'll notice they feel a lot tighter and you're a little less controlled in feathering your brakes. You're pulling on them harder. If you're further down on the lever in the drops, you got a little bit more control, especially for those of us using cantilever uh, rim style brakes as opposed to disc brakes which are a little more effective in that regard. But think of it like a teeter-totter. The further you are towards the end of the teeter-totter, the less weight and the less force is needed to, uh, to elicit the same result. Same thing goes for your brakes on your bike. The lower you pull on them, the less force or tension you need to exert to get your bike to come to a stop or slow down. So I hope this was a little bit more helpful of a clarification. At the end of the day, you can ride however the hell you want. You don't need my approval for it, and we don't have to agree on this subject. It's just something that I've come across. And a lot of us, I think, look to pro racers and wish to have their style, their panache, their skill. And we think we're gonna emulate them. But the best thing to learn from if you're gonna race is learn from higher category racers nearby that you're gonna compete against eventually. Because it's gonna be a more real life scenario and real life skills that you're going to be able to learn from as opposed to the pros who are on a completely different level. Well yesterday my legs felt like complete dog shit. Today my legs feel good but now I'm at the 50 mile mark and my heart rate's definitely starting to break down. Just my whole cardio respiratory system is a little bit depressed right now. If I had to guess, I kind of screwed up my hydration yesterday and today. When it's cooler out, I tend not to drink as much. I could be very camel-like when I ride. I'm trying to work on that, but I haven't put enough attention into it the last few days. But I think I'm paying for it now. So before I get showered and complacent, I'm going to take care of something that's long overdue. That's disgusting. My preliminary uh, review of the muck off cleaner is actually very good. Uh, it actually helped me get my uh, drivetrain cleaner faster than just using, like I usually use like a Dawn dish soap and then uh, WD-40. It really just kind of blasted the grease and the muck and the garbage off really fast. So it's like 15 bucks a bottle, but I didn't really use that much of it. Uh, you know, used it with the spray bottle so it kind of... Um, exaggerated the surface area that you could use it on. I'm sure you could use it, you know, in a bucket with uh, water or what have you as like a kind of a soapy water, but uh, I would definitely recommend it. I, could, I picked it up on Amazon for like 15 bucks. It's a pretty big bottle. I don't know what, how many ounces it looks like. It might be around 30 ounces. I'll have to double check, but uh, it's a great product. It's the first time I've used it and I'll probably use it every time I wash my bike. So it was a good buy there, but I'm going to get myself showered. I'm going to do some grocery shopping, get shit ready for tomorrow. But I'm going to end the vlog here because, quite frankly, there's nothing more to see here. But thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.